therapy, therapy's relationship to homosexuality, and, and in particular, I'm going to be focusing on male homosexuality, and that's partly because that's where most of the literature, most of the research, and most of the contention has been, has been a highly ambivalent relationship. Therapists like that term, ambivalent, don't they? Uh, lesbianism is, is virtually absent for much of the story, and I think that's the sexism inherent in psychology that means that most of the story that I'm telling about is male homosexuality. However, Joanna Ryan and Maureen O'Connor, in their seminal book, Wild Desires and Mistaken Identities, extensively explore the relationship between lesbianism and psychoanalysis, and it's well worth a read. These slides can all be available, if you email me, and there'll be an email address at the end, you can get these slides from me afterwards. Um, I'll send them out to you. <clears throat> One thing is clear, um, that we, and by that I mean gender and sexual minorities, seem to hold a fascination for therapists. And therapy holds a fascination for us. In general, we seek out or engage in therapy more than heterosexuals do. We have poorer mental health than heterosexuals due to living in a society that pathologizes us. And yet therapists are rarely ever trained to work with us or to understand us, which can lead at best to well-meaning attempts to, to uh, uh, can lead to at best well-meaning attempts at understanding, and at worst attempts to cure something that isn't sick. And we'll be talking about that a bit more later. Um, I'm going to start with Freud, and this is a cartoon by my favourite cartoonist, David Shenton. If you can read it, I'll read it. It says, me and John at the Sigmund Freud Foundation for Psychoanalysis Museum. I think they had to call it that so that they didn't get sued. Um, wondering whether the couch would look nicer over by the window. And it's... I think it speaks to a particular gay sensibility, really. Um, I, I'm stunned at how often I go out with my friends and the first thing that we do when we arrive in a space is we move the furniture around to make it look right or feel a bit more comfortable. Maybe it's the interior designer gene that's, that's, that's working in us all. Um, and before, so before Freud, mental illness and homosexuality in particular was considered a sin we were morally bankrupt. And that this view still holds true in most fundamentalist religions. It's one of the few things that Jews, Christians, Catholics, and Muslims can all agree on. A mutual condemnation of same-sex desire and sexual expression. They're united in their denunciation and vilification of the homosexual. Now, whilst Freud gets, often gets the blame it's the post-Freudians who have caused much of the problem for lesbians and gay men. Bayer in 1981 and Richard Isay in 1996 tell us that in Austria and Germany prior to World War I, psychoanalysis was at the forefront of some radical social ideas. However, the Nazi persecution of the Jews around the early 20s, 1920s, caused all those avant-garde Jewish psychiatrists and psychoanalysts to flee for New York City and for London. That tends to be where they, where they went off to. And when they got there, they needed to assimilate into the dominant social values of a much more conservative culture. Homosexuality was, of course, a crime in the USA and the UK. So these previously radical and liberal thinkers found employment when they were in the States, they mostly went into the military psychiatry and de de dealing with people suffering from what we now refer to as PTSD um, and in treating gay soldiers because homosexuality only until very recently in, in the States was um, a, an offence. And so they, people get, gay guys would get bound together or stories would be found out about them and then they'd be sent to psychiatrists for treatment. Here in the UK, the Jewish psychiatrists helped found the Tavistock Clinic and needed to assimilate into a more conservative social context in Hampstead. Um, homosexuality was viewed as a mental illness and they, these people built their careers and their reputations in doing what they believed helped people. 
In both countries, they were involved in trialing and experimenting over many decades various untested treatments, from psychoanalysis to behavior therapy, to cross-sex hormones and castration. Lewis, who's a gay psychoanalyst writing in the States, tells us, from Freud's early, from Freud's first discoveries up until the Second World War, psychoanalytic history can be described, I think, as moderately homophobic. Freud himself, I'm happy to report, was relatively free of that prejudice. He wrote about homosexuality with respect, modesty, and genuine curiosity. Privately and publicly, he opposed legal sanctions against homosexuals, and officially, though ineffectually, forbade their exclusion from analytic training. In America, psychoanalysis abandoned its role as a critic of social, value, social forms and values, and became a propagandist and an enforcer of them. This shift was most apparent in the normative discourse about two vexed subjects, the problem of homosexuality. Um, well, sorry, two vexed subjects, the character, the character and sexuality of women, and our topic today, the problem of homosexuality. The latter project reified homosexual people into a type, the homosexual, who was essentially determined by his sexual interests. He was either a pitiable psychic cripple or a morally reprehensible sociopath, indifferent and hostile to laws and moral rules. The possibility of high-functioning and productive homosexuals, like myself, was explicitly denied, even at the cost of denying examples of homosexual achievements in the arts. Published clinical material is even more appalling, dwelling repetitively on the unpleasant character and the manipulativeness of the homosexual patients. The tone of such anal analysts such as Edmund Burglar, 1956, is smug, superior, and sardonic. They clearly hated their patients and frequently reported sudden terminations, attributing them to their patients' failure of nerve or character. Comparisons to Nazis became a cliche. There's even more, there's even some straight-faced discussion of, quote, a final solution to the problem of homosexuality, end quote. And that comes from um, loose, loose, um, paper in, on homosexuality and psychoanalysis. Again, the reference will be in the, in the paper. Now, I guess, probably more than any other model, psychoanalysis has, you know, I, I, it would be easy just to kind of hate psychoanalysis, but probably more than any other model, it has developed some, some profound understandings of gay psychology and some reinterpretation of, of yeah, quite sound analytic ideas. And see in particular Noreen O'Connor and Joanna Ryan, Wild Desires and Mistaken Identities, Kenneth Lewis, who I've mentioned, Judith Glasgold and Suzanne Iacenza, and their work on lesbians and psychoanalysis, the work of Richard Isay and Jack Drescher, for example. In the site for contemporary psychoanalysis in London, They've been training psychoanalytically oriented therapists in this area for many years. So I don't want to come across as being entirely hating of psychoanal psychoanalysis. I think it's done, I think it's a, it, it, it's a model that has a terrible history. And actually some of the contemporary psychoanalysis can be very useful. Pretty much every theoretical model has its own history though. And, every, and, 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 a, and its own stance on homosexuality. And this is the second book that I put together with Charles Neal. And you'll see the contents on the, on the left-hand side. There's quite a range of different models that we, we included in that book, and it'll be across in the library if you're students here. And so if you're interested, you could follow this up later. Um, there are more recent papers that have been written as well. So there's been a paper on looking at integrative therapy by Peter Meeves, 
Um, my recent paper on systemic therapy with gender and sexual minorities by Catherine Butler. Uh, Meg Barker has written one on sex and relationship therapy from an existential approach. And there may be others that I've forgotten to list. So there's been a lot of work about trying to look at what has been the historical relationship between homosexuality and the model. Um, my, my own work was it was in my own training was in person centered theory, and the person centered theory had not said anything about homosexuality until I published a paper in 1998 um, uh, looking at the six necessary and sufficient conditions. And that was the first paper that the approach of the, the, where homosexuality had been taken uh, to, uh, to, to be explained. Um, and I subsequently wrote a co wrote a chapter on psychological contact, which those of you that know about person centered theory. We'll, we'll know that that's the first of Roger's six conditions. Um, and I co-wrote that with Maggie April in, in a book by P. Sanders. Um, looking at how it's very hard for the therapist to get into psychological contact if they've got their own baggage that's getting in the way. And how it can be very difficult for the client to get into psychological contact when we've got this kind of history in our own collective unconscious. So, Returning to treatment and to cure, there's a social and oral history project uh, on this website, treatmentshomosexuality.org.uk, which interviews patients and therapists who were engaged in various treatments to make people heterosexual over the years. Um, it's really quite interesting to listen to some of the, um, or to, to lead and to listen to some of the accounts from therapists when they admit what they were doing didn't work, was often harmful, despite trying to be helpful. I mean, most of the people who were engaged in offering us therapy were trying to help us, even if they weren't doing a particularly good job. They were situated in a particular social context without any training, and, and, and well, where the training had been to see us as, as mentally ill. Some of the audio recordings of people who have suffered from long-term problems as a result of engaging in these treatments are also interesting. Not just psychoanalysis, but behavior therapy, aversion therapy, which was big in the 50s and 60s, and even into the 1970s. Neurosurgery hormone therapy. Uh, the site also includes a short YouTube video of a, a documentary on Alan Turing who committed suicide, just it was, it was where he was being interviewed just before he committed suicide. He was um, being forced to, to take estrogen as a, as a treatment for his homosexuality because he'd been caught cottaging. Cottaging is meeting men in the sex and public toilets for those who are familiar Cottage is closed down, so it's probably an archaic term now for young people. If um, it, was, it was rare that any of the treatments worked, what they usually did was extinguish any sexual desire, cause depression, and often lead to suicidal attempts uh, uh, or suicide itself. Those who were able to terminate therapy, and therapy was often called sanctioned in those days, and did so often by feigning cure. So these magical treatments that people say, oh, they got better, the therapist writes a case, oh, they got better, the therapy worked. Well, they probably kidded the therapist in order to get out of there. <laughs> Homosexuality uh, was declassified as a mental illness by the, by the American Psychiatric Association in 1973. And it was at a time when, at that point, they added gender identity disorder. And it's an interesting coincidence that they take homosexuality out and they decide to create a new illness for them to treat. Uh, great expense on um, uh, um, pathologizing transsexuals. The, the, declassif the story around the declassification is quite an interesting one. And it came about through a mixture of direct action, um, which in those days was known as zapping. So the APA conference in 1970 was being held in San Francisco. So of all places to hold the conference <laughs> and try to get some political action together. Um, and a bunch of gay activists who uh, raided the conference. Now, the, the year before, the Stonewall riots happened in New York, and this, which is where a bunch of drag queens and, and transgender people uh, took over 
a, pub, a bar that had been raided by the police. The police had been raiding these bars on a regular basis. And they held some policemen hostage and they barricaded themselves in. And they went on like this for three days and three nights. And that was the beginning of the gay rights movement in New York in 1969. So a year later, in San Francisco, the American Psychiatric Association decided to hold their annual conference. And in the conference, presenting that day, on the one particular day, was Irving Bieber. Bieber was a, uh, produced some research in the 50s and 60s and into the 70s. It's the kind of research that you'll be familiar with because it's the idea that homosexuality is caused by a close, binding mother and a distant father. That was his kind of key theory. And it was based on 70 psychoanalysts completing questionnaires for 100 gay men. So they've done, they've done their psychoanalysis from 100 patients, and on the basis of that 100, they filled in the answers. Of what, and then sent it off to Bieber, and, and he came up with this particular theory. So most of these therapists hadn't seen more than one or two patients, so they weren't very experienced or informed, is my point. Anyway, the activists raid the conference, and they rush to the front, and they call Bieber a motherfucker, <laughs> which I think is highly appropriate term. The following year, the activists came back. Um, this time, the conference was being held, um, and, and the uh, so there's Act in '71, and the following year, personal testimony addressing the conference in Dallas from a character, a psychiatrist, a gay psychiatrist called Doctor Anonymous. So they, had to, they found a psychiatrist who was willing to talk about his own experience, but he had to dress up uh, with a beard, with a fake beard, hat, clothes that were way too big for him, to try to disguise him, because if he were to be out, he could lose his job. You know, homosexuality was still a mental illness. How could you be treating people? So he risked his professional reputation. The character's name, the psychiatrist's name is John Fryer. So he gave this this rather heartfelt story about his own experience of being a gay man to the, to the conference as Dr. Anonymous. In 1973, the APA went to Hawaii. Don't they get around? It's fantastic. Venues. <laughs> Hawaii, wow. Um, the BACP conferences are in Warwick. <laughs> We're in the wrong profession, folks. Um, okay, and Spitzer, um, a guy called Robert Spitzer, who was a psychiatrist, had by then he'd been mediating with some of these gay activists. Um, and they had arranged to have a debate. So at the conference, Spitzer had got um, these gay activists to come up onto the platform to sit and have a proper adult debate with Bieber, the motherfucker, and Charles Socarides. Charles Socarides was uh, a psychiatrist whose own son was gay. He was Clinton's advisor on HIV and AIDS. And Socarides had this, I came up with more theories about homosexuality being caused by absent fathers or um, sadistic fathers or abusive fathers. So it's kind of interesting about like, what position we were set off, what's going on there. Um, but again, at one of these kinds of therapists who's in denial about their, their own son's homosexuality. Um, I'll talk about that a bit further as well. Um, so it wasn't just activism, though, that was going on. Uh, it was inside the APA, there had been some political strategizing uh, via the Committee for Concerned Psychiatry, which is a great title, Committee for Concerned Psychiatry. And John, a guy called John P. Spiegel, who was president-elect for the APA, and other young and some gay psychiatrists became actively involved in the APA to replace what they called the grey-haired conservatives, because there was this the kind of very middle-aged sense of psychiatry. In, and in the 70s, these younger modern psychiatrists wanted to, to get themselves in committees and change psychiatry and make it a bit more forward-thinking and create what we now know as modern psychiatry. So there was, there was an action, a movement going on inside. And then also, throughout the 60s, there had been fringe meetings at the APA that weren't known about very pu publicly, but there were these closeted psychiatrists who referred to themselves as the gay PA. But they were unfortunately far too scared to become involved in any campaign, frightened of losing their prestigious positions. 
has a wonderful podcast which I can give you access to by the granddaughter of Spiegel. She, she's a journalist. And who, incidentally, he didn't come out to his family until he was 70. So he became president of the APA, stayed in the closet, and it was at his 70th birthday, all the family kind of went off on a little vacation together, and they, his grandfather was coming out of his villa by the pool with this young man on his arm, and that was his coming out to his family at 70. You know, it's like, it's not easy for people sometimes, um, but that was his way of doing it. The, um, the World Health Organization declassified homosexuality in 1992, so just around the corner in my memory, um, but they added egodystonic homosexuality. Um, and that, that's kind of the move that the APA did too, when they took it out in 1973, homosexuality out, they created this this category called all ego dystonic, which means if you're not very happy about it, kind of homosexuality. Um, and then they quietly dropped that in 1987, five years before the, the, the World Health Organization declassified homosexuality, but, but we kept it in for a while longer. Other notable events in our history and timeline. As we if you notice that 1973 is quite a popular year here. Exodus International was formed. Have you heard of Exodus? Exodus is one of these reparative, what was the first reparative therapy organization. The evangelical Christians who were going to help us pray the gay away. Now, they're a huge multi-million pound, uh, billion dollar organization, international, huge tower block building in the States, lots of staff, make a lot of money, collect a lot of money. They go around in churches, because America is more religious than here, they go around the church in America and they pass the pay place to, you know, save your son from sodomy, give generously. And so the parents are piling all the money and it's going off to, to, to fund this organization. Now, the founders of Exodus, the three founders of Exodus, have publicly apologized for the harm that they've done and they resigned from the organization. And on YouTube, there's a really interesting video that you can watch. Uh, one of the founders was a, a, a British vicar called Jeremy Marks, and he founded this organization called Courage, or the Courage Trust. Um, he tried to cure gays for years, himself included, uh, including getting married and all sorts, <clears throat> realized it wasn't working, and then had the humility and sense to, uh, to stop doing that and try to help people accept and understand themselves. Um, NARF, which is the National Association for Research and Treatment into Homosexuality, was founded in 1992 um, by Joseph Nicolosi, who I've been on Channel 4 TV with as a head-to-head, -head, uh, trying to fight with him. He was terribly shaky and nervous. Uh, a guy called Benjamin Kaufman and, and Charles Socorides, the late Charles Socorides. Um, it was, it's ironic that the Sigmund that Freud, um, NARF, award, what they call the Sigmund Freud Award for Advances in Conversion Therapy, and they give this out every year. And I think if Paul Siggy knew, he'd be spinning, spinning in his grave that they were taking his name and name like that. So, so they call what they do conversion therapy, sexual conversion therapy, reparative therapy, sexual re orientation therapy, sexual orientation there's another one, uh, SOCE, Sexual Orientation Conversion Efforts, I think it is. I'll probably come on to that in a minute. It's quite hard to do research into homosexuality. Um, most of the research that came, was, came done, was done at the, initially was done from a clinical population. So until the 50s, late 50s, often very damaged and very unwell people who were deeply conflicted living through a time of great condemnation, would go to see help from psychiatrists and psychologists. And these therapists often generalized from a single case and wrote case studies. I mean, psychoanalysis is still like that, really. They made these extraordinary claims based on one single case that they worked with. Um, no one did any research on a non-clinical population until Evelyn Hooker came along. She was a great lass. She was a North American psychologist, most famous for her paper in 1957, 
the adjustment of the male overt homosexual. She had gay friends, and she was going to parties and meeting these really rather charming, well-adjusted men who would move the furniture around and live in very tasteful homes. And she um, thought, well, you seem quite normal. You're not like the kind of crazy homosexuals that I'm reading about and that my colleagues are meeting. So what's going on here? And she realized that maybe she did some research. And so what she did was she uh, developed a research protocol where she invited lots of gay men who were normal, well-adjusted gay men that hadn't been in therapy to undertake a series of personality and mental health functioning tests. Then she gave those results to people who were independent um, researchers and said, spot, spot the homosexuals, mark these, and see if you can pick out the neurotic traits and the well, and, and, and people who aren't very well adjusted. Um, and she, she did this she did some control with heterosexuals. And the, these experts who were kind of independently looking at these couldn't tell the gays from the straights. So she found, and other people subsequently repeated that research because they couldn't quite believe she got it right, that, 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 um, that it demonstrated that most self-identified homosexuals were no worse in social adjustment than the general population. Kinsey did, some, did some, a big study in 1948 with men, and in 1953 he published around women, uh, a big survey into sexual behavior. Um, and he found one of his biggest um, statistics, really, uh, for me, I think, is that he found 37% of adult males reported sex with another man to orgasm. 37% had had sex to orgasm with another man. So that's pretty high. Now, it's difficult when you do research because it's difficult to know what constitutes a gay person or a lesbian person or a bisexual person when everybody's definitions seem to be a bit different. Um, sometimes they're looking at behavior and what you actually do, and that isn't necessarily a good way of determining it. Sometimes it's about people who identify as and say I am, and they may not always feel comfortable telling the truth. I mean, some of you might have been LGBT and didn't put your hands up earlier, because it might not have felt safe enough to do so, and that's fine. You know, it's like it doesn't always feel safe. Um, and so it's really hard to get the measurements right and to know what's really going on. Um, and then there are often researches being done with very small samples. Um, it's very hard to get a random sample. Uh, people are usually self-selecting. So if you tried to find gay people or bisexual people to do research, where would you go to get them? Or you might think, well, we've put adverts in the gay press. Well, that only gets the people who are reading the gay press. I haven't picked up a gay magazine in ages, so I probably wouldn't see that kind of stuff. Do you go knocking at the doors and, oh, hello, are you any homosexuals living here? <laughs> it's like, mm, fuck off, I'm not going to tell you. Um, it's, it's, the census was an issue. People were saying, oh, well, we should put it in the census. But the census is filled in by the head of the household, um, really. And so the head of the household might, might not want to be out to the head of the household. Um, and the people knowing your business. So even if your student's living in a, in a shared house, if the census comes in unless you won't ask for a specific one for yourself, you're all counted. So it's, it's very hard to get accurate information. Um, now, bringing us into a more contemporary era, and leaving a historical perspective, I thought it would be useful just to talk a little bit about what's going on now in terms of therapy and its relationship to homosexuality. Um, this is a clip from the UKCP website. Uh, I was consulted by the UKCP chair, Professor Andrew, Andrew Summers, on their statement about reparative therapy. Um, and rather smartly, I managed to get transgender included as a non-pathology. Um, so he didn't quite understand I, well, I think he understood the issues well enough, but he consulted me and he consulted Jack Drescher, who's this big name psychoanalyst in New York, who's much more conservative than me. Drescher said, oh no, you can't have transgender in there, because, you know, because it's still seen as a pathology by the DSM, and Drescher's actually on the committee with DSM-5, trying to look at research and is keeping it in there. So, um, I, uh, I'm saying, no, you can't possibly, you know, how can you... How can you have transgender or gender identity disorder as a, as a mental illness 
when it's actually an endocrine disorder because the only effective treatment for this condition is the administration of cross-sex hormones. There is no treatment, there's no psychological therapy, there is no psychological cure. You can help people get more support and adjust, do it better through therapy. Not that the NHS does that very much, but it's, it's actually, there's no, there's no mental health treatment for it. The way that you treat people is you give them some cross-sex hormones, and then if they're physically able to take the surgery, you would maybe do some surgery. So how can you call it a mental illness? So he kind of backed down and said, oh, okay, good answer, good answer, fair enough. BACP um, uh, have not really got a policy about reparative therapy. They made a press statement, their press spokesman made a press statement in, in the summer of 2009, around the time when Joseph Nicolosi was last over, um, and condemned it. And the BPS Psychology of Sexuality section also made a statement, but that's still to be formally endorsed by the BPS. So that might have implications for people seeing NHS psychologists. Um, some of you will be familiar with um, the story of Patrick Strudwick, and others of you will be on, well, it will be new. Patrick Strudwick is a journalist who went to a conference in 2009, when Nicolosi was over, and the day after I'd seen him in, in the Channel 4 studio and did this little head-to-head challenging many silly ideas. And uh, Strudwick went to the conference, and he went undercover. Um, and in the, in the conference, it was a conference for Christian activists and for counsellors and, and um, vicars and this and people like this, um, around homosexuality, trying to promote the idea that you can cure it. Well, speaking from the floor was a psychiatrist in, um, who lives in Northern Ireland. And in fact, he was the advisor to Iris Robinson. Do you remember the story about Iris Robinson saying, oh, she knew a, a, a psychiatrist who could cure gay people? This was before she got caught with some young lad and um, had to leave office um, for having sex with, um, being unfaithful to her husband and having sex with some young man. Anyway, Paul Miller was the psychiatrist. Um, and then Stradwick also approached this uh, BACP accredited counsellor, senior accredited counsellor. Um, and they both said, oh yes, well we treat people. And so he went on and said, well, could you treat me? I'm an unhappy gay man and I'd like to be cured, please. And so they agreed, and he didn't tell them who he really was. Um, and he went to see, he had sessions with Paul Miller on Skype, and, and um, who very, who, who explicit, tried to ex very, quite explicitly arouse him during the sessions with fantasies and stuff. Um, and Paul Miller was apparently an ex-gay. So there was all sorts of stuff going on there. Um, and probably used to see, you know, web, webcam sex or something, but forgot his professional boundaries. Anyway, um, Leslie Pilkington was the senior accredited psychotherapist with BACP. And he went to see her in her home, home, home in just north of London and um, strapped a tape recorder to his tummy and um, recorded the entire sessions. They had two sessions with her. And, um, she believed that his homosexuality had been caused by him being sexually abused as a child. And he said, well, I don't remember being abused by a child, as a child. And she said, well, you have. Let's pray together now for the Holy Spirit to enter you and help you recover those memories, because you're clearly repressing them. She worked for the NHS as well as a GP counsellor. Anyway, um, Patrick wasn't very happy with the policy of care that he'd received from these two people. And he took formal complaints to the GMC for the psychiatrist and to BACP. And, um, and he wrote his story out. Uh, Fifteen months later, the BACP complaints hearing, very recently, you can see the data on there, recently found that Pilkington had been, quote, reckless, disrespectful, dogmatic, and unprofessional. They upheld his complaint and suspended her accreditation and insisted that she undertake further training and supervision. Now, I think that was quite a smart move on their part. I mean, part of me was furious that they hadn't sacked her. 
But if they'd have sacked, she was being represented by the Christian Institute lawyers. If they'd have sacked her, she'd have brought civil proceedings against loss of income and all sorts of things, and more victimization. What they've said is, you've broken the codes of ethics, you need more training. You're clearly misinformed, you need more training. If she refuses to go and get more training, which of course she will, uh, and she has, need, she has a need for training, you know, I'm available. Um, well, running the leading organization, it's kind of inevitable that she should be going to need for training, but I don't think it's likely. Um, and supervision. Um, <laughs> if she, if she, um, sh she'll just say that she, she won't do it, I'm sure. Uh, it was very difficult to, uh, to get her a hearing together. Um, the G oh, by the way, the GMC decided not to pursue Paul Miller. Um, they didn't even give call a hearing for, for his evidence, um, which was pretty poor show on their part. And that's despite the, the British Medical Association and the Royal College of Psychiatrists having made statements condemning reparative therapy. So they need to look to themselves. Um, just before the, um, the hearing was due in January, the first hearing, um, and BACP had quite a lot of problems in finding what they, what they tried to call a neutral panel. People who didn't have strong feelings about whether homosexuality was a good thing or a bad thing, and, um, or whether what she'd done was a good thing or a bad thing. Uh, so they had some trouble they finding a neutral panel, but, so it took them a long time. And when they finally called the panel together, just the week before, like four days before she was due to come to have the complaint held, she went and told her story to the Daily Mail, thereby sabotaging the hearing, um, a preemptive strike to whip up media attention and garner sympathy, um, and to prejudice a fair hearing. So BACP then had to postpone the hearing for the dust to die, for the dust to settle. Um, so it, that, that's. It's like, it's bad enough that that's going on. It gets worse. Now these slides are used with the permission of Professor Mike King. Mike King has done a lot of research, probably all, pretty much all of British research, into LGB mental health and therapies, therapy for about the last 15 years. So these slides are used with his permission and he He's, I, I programmed him to speak at a conference that I, that I, that UKCP and Pink Therapy put together, um, and he's quite happy for me to use them. This is a very interesting research study, um, and you can download it on the net. It's free, and so he wanted to explore the response of mental health professionals to clients seeking help about their sexual orientation, um, and he wanted what he did was. He did a postal questionnaire survey that was both qualitative and quantitative. He asked professionals their views about the treatment, about treatments to change homosexual desires, and to describe if they had done so up to six patients whom they treated. He did a stratified random sample of members of the BPS, the BACP, UKCP, and the Royal College of Psychiatrists. And so they weren't just going to people who only practiced in London or Wigan or Nottingham or wherever. They, they kind of went through and did a certain number of yeah, every tenth person on the regist membership registers. They sent them a questionnaire, that kind of thing. It was very random, um, trying to balance it for gender and stuff like this. They contacted 1,848 practitioners. So that's a pretty substantial um, sample. They had a 1,406 questionnaires returned, 72%, um, and, and of those, 72% could be analysed. That's an amazing response rate from therapists willing to, sell, to tell their experiences on, on this issue. How would they respond to a client who wished to change or redirect their sexual orientation? Only 4% said they would attempt, they would attempt to to, or to redirect the client's sexual orientation, 4%. However, a further 10% said they would refer to a therapist who would do so. They were mostly psychiatrists wanting to palm them off onto, onto counsellors. Um, 222 professionals, so one in six, had assisted at least one client or patient to reduce or change their same-sex desires. 
and then they were asked to describe up to five patients. So like 17% of my own colleagues have agreed to enter into these kinds of contracts to reduce or change someone's sexual orientation. Now, speaking to my kid, he thinks this is way underreported. So 413 patients were described by the 222 therapists. 52% of those were seen in private practice. 28% were not followed up beyond the period of treatment. So you don't really know what happens in the end. Counseling was the most common treatment offered. Um, and 92% of them had been treated since 1980, some time after the declassification. That's what the aim was, trying to see people, not who had been treated back in the 50s and 60s, but contemporary people. Um, this is where the, professionals, the professional affiliation of those who have been treated, so the BPS, UKCP, you can see the figures there. Psychologists saw quite a lot, but it's pretty evenly split between the psychologists, the psychotherapists, and, um, and the ACP members. What were the reasons people were wanting to, to, to go for change? They said they were confused about their sexual orientation. Largely, that was the, the, the issue. There were social pressures, including the family. Some of them were depressed or anxious. A few had religious beliefs. Some were confused about their gender. For some, it was legal pressures. Nine of them were in heterosexual relationship and having difficulties. Um, eight of them said they were victims of abusive relationships. These are pretty normal things that people go to see therapists for. Um, so most of them had received counselling. These are the treatment approaches. Um, should services be available to help people change their sexual orientation was one of the questions. And 72% of the 222 therapists who provided treatment considered that a service should be available for people who wanted to change their sexual orientation. Um, one of the most common reasons for this is, is a kind of really poor understanding of client autonomy. Um, so the client is the expert on their life. I'm just there to help them accept themselves. If that's what they want to do, if they don't want to be a homosexual, it's my job to trust that and to help them be heterosexual because they know themselves best. Now they come at that because they've had no training in their, in their courses to realize the damage that can be done from colluding with the assumption that you're sick in the first place and what you're feeling is wrong. Um, so it's, it's a result of very poor training on the part of these, of these therapists. Um, so making clients heterosexual, uh, a few quotes that we'll, we'll put in the qualitative study, because some clients or patients are unsure of whether they are really homosexual, particularly young adults under 25. Um, I'm sure there could be, I'm sure there are cases of bisexuality or sexual ambivalence, where counselling could be offered to motivated individuals. Although homosexual feelings are usual in people, their physical expression and being a, a, person own, a person's only way of having sexual relationships is problematic. The physical act for male homosexuals is physically damaging and is the main reason for, in this country for HIV and AIDS. It's also perverse. Somebody working in the NHS This research is um, just a few years ago, 2009, I think it published. 2008, 2009. Um, so his conclusions were a significant minority of therapists, one in six, will offer therapy to change or redirect a homosexual orientation. Despite there being no evidence of any effectiveness, there are no, there, you know, if we tried to find evidence-based medicine going on here, evidence-based treatment, there wouldn't be any. The commonest motivation for change is confusion, and confusion about sexuality may well be a normal life trajectory. 
Confusion about sexuality involves fear, stigma, and shame. And these therapies are kind of colluding with that. Um, they draw upon, largely, I think, um, the models that come from reparative therapy. So I thought it probably would be useful just to spend a little bit of time telling you a little bit about these reparative therapies that are, that are being put forward. Um, they use, so, so sexual conversion therapy, sexual orientation change efforts was the one I can remember. It utilizes some pretty outdated psychoanalytic ideas of faulty parenting. So for men, they've, got, they've had overclose mothers, no adequate paternal role model. For women, they've failed to bond with their mothers uh, or, or engage in gender typical behaviors. So they, little girls are not baking cakes and sewing buttons on and making clothes. And boys are not play kicking the football around. Um, or their homosexuality has been caused by childhood sexual abuse and or uh, and they've repressed those memories. So their treatment is usually to encourage male bonding. If you're a guy, you've got to go out and hang out with the guys, and you've got to roughhouse around and do a bit of wrestling, uh, play sports. Contact sports is really well advocated, in fact. Um, uh, you should attend counselling and group therapy, so you're all sitting there in a group with the other guys talking about your feelings and opening up. And in one kind of, of these kinds of therapies, run by a guy called Cohen, um, being held by someone of the same gender is a very important part. So you find another man who will hold you, and you know that will stop your homosexual feelings. <laughs> um, and beating cushions. He has this thing, there's a great YouTube video of him with a tennis racket, and he's beating cushions and being really angry. Because it's all about repressed feelings and stuff. So, the, it, so if you fall from the straight and narrow, you know, you go to the therapist and he says, right, well, I, you know, okay, little Johnny, you're, you don't want to be a homosexual and that's good because I can help kill you and with God's help we can do it together and it's all going to be fine and your parents don't want you to be homosexual and so um, it, you know, your community doesn't want you to be homosexual because most of these people seeking reparative therapy are coming from evangelical communities where their families are really involved with it all. Um, so I'm going to be available to you whenever you need me, here's my number, you call me, we're going to meet regularly, you're going to go to group therapy with the boys, you're going to do a bit of sport, a bit of wrestling, and um, just, we'll see what happens, okay? And so the guy goes away and he comes and talks about sexual fantasies and his feelings, and the therapist kind of steers him into fantasizing about girls and trying to encourage him to go out and date girls. But he comes in and he says, well, he's been a bit close to these guys, and he's, you know, he found himself getting hard while he's doing some wrestling, while he's falling in love with someone who's group therapy. Oh, try not to think about that, you know, mustn't do that. So he falls off the straight and narrow and starts having sexual relationships or feels guilty, comes back and talks about it. Pray for it. We've got to stop this. You're not, you know, you're not trying hard enough now. You've really got to try. I'm doing my best. You're not working with me here. Um, and you're letting God down. So the guy carries on a bit longer and a bit longer and a bit longer. These therapies take about four years. It's quite intense before you get much that evidence of very much change. So what tends to happen is people become very depressed and very suicidal at their natural feelings emerging and um, acting on these feelings. And so um, if they're smart, they get out of therapy, but they leave very, feeling very mixed up, very angry with all the broken promises, the lies, and the deceit. Um, and that makes it very hard for them to trust any other therapist again because of having had such a bad experience with, with their therapist. Um, because there's nowhere for them to go. They've alienated the family, they've alienated their God, they've hurt their therapist, he's was upset with them. But it's happening still a lot, and it's growing in this country. Um, the, the evangelical community um, is increasing. It's a, it's a particularly big community for people of African and Afro-Caribbean descent who are living here. 
So pity the poor black kids who are involved, you know, who are coming out as gay. Robert Spitzer tried to do some research. Remember I talked about Spitzer getting that panel together at the APA of the activists and Bieber and Socarides? Well, he was very involved at the beginning trying to get homosexuality declassified. Um, and then he, he wanted to do some research to see whether these reparative therapies work or not. So he thought, well, I'm independent. I'll, I'll conduct some research because they're all saying it works. And all the gay therapists say, oh, it doesn't work. Because they're seeing the casualties from it. Um, so he said, well, I'll try. So in 2003, he, um, he did a study. And he telephoned people who had been found for him by uh, the ex-gay movement. So he said, he contacted all these ex-gay organizations and said, right, well, put, put, up, put forward your best cases and let me meet and talk, or let me talk to the people who you say have, have now been cured and are, are functioning heterosexually. So um, his study involved telephone interviews of 45 minutes asking 60 questions about people's feelings and behavior before, during, and after their efforts to change their orientation. Uh, he interviewed 143 ex-gays and 57 ex-lesbians. All were found through the ex-gay movement. Most were active members of the ex-gay movement, of these organizations that were trying to treat people, um, who put them forward. And the therapeutic techniques involved counseling, support, groups, prayer, and mentoring. Now, the methodology was critiqued massively. It was published in the Archives of Sexual Behavior, his research, and then the entire rest of the archive of the journal was devoted to people, dif different approaches, different critiques of his methodology. The sample was highly biased, coming from only those whose self-report claim, that their self-report was that they cured. There was no corroboration sought from their partners. There was no assessment of their sexual orientation prior to their treatment. So we don't know whether they were exclusively gay to start with or whether they were bisexual. Um, it was um, a bit of a mess, really. So of the 200 subjects, 86 had been referred to him by conservative Christian groups specializing in converting homosexuals. Nath put forward 46 people, um, and this is what he found. 86% of the men and 63% of all subjects emerged from therapy still having feelings of attraction to people of the same sex. That is, after the therapy, they're bisexuals, not heterosexuals, even though they might say they're not gay, you know, they're heterosexual now. They still got these feelings. 16 of the men, 21 of the women, report that they now have a heterosexual orientation. It's not known how many of these entered therapy as bisexuals and how many had been homosexuals. Of the 112 men, out of the total of 143 who acknowledged they masturbated, acknowledging their masturbation, I think that's interesting. More than half, more than half of those said they used homosexual fantasies some of the time, and about one third said they seldom had opposite sex masturbation fantasies. And this is cure. This is, and they, they quote, they, they, the, the, the organizations like Mark and Exodus quote Spitzer and say, that it has been independently verified. We are curing people. Look, Dr. Spitzer says so. And they actually don't tell you the nature of the results, um, which is slightly misleading, but now you know. Um, those of you that are therapists might want to follow up this research again. It's from Mike King. It's a huge systematic review of mental disorder, suicide, and deliberate self-harm in LGBT people. Mike King does really solid research. He's team tear apart other people's research. Some years ago, he did, a, he did a big study for BACP, commissioned by BACP, to look at a systematic review into uh, therapy with gay people or gay uh, LGBT people and see what works and what doesn't work and what's helpful. Um, very rigorous. His um, 
data set for this uh, was three using data from 314,344 heterosexuals and 11,971 non-heterosexuals. 25 case studies they studied, and they came up with this conclusion. LGBT people are at high risk of mental disorder, suicide ideation, substance abuse, and deliberate self-harm. Higher, higher abuse than, than heterosexual people. Um, so, it, it, it goes on a lot more, but I don't really want to take up the entire time to about it. I want to come more or less to the conclusions. So is therapy useful? How is therapy useful? I mean, if some of you are consumers of therapy, not therapists, um, then it might be useful to kind of, for me to try to spell out why I think I'm doing what I'm doing and have been doing it for 30 years. I, um, I think we can increase people's self-awareness and insight, and we can reduce the impact of mental health stressors, so we can help people manage depression, anxiety, substance, misuse. We can build self-esteem and self-confidence, tackling shame due to heterosexism and, to, and sexual shame. Um, we can help people develop relationship and dating skills because gay people don't learn how to date, really. Um, you know, our models are Hollywood movies. That's where, heter that's where heterosexuals learn how to date. We see it in the Hollywood movies all the time. But when you get two guys together, well, who asks who out? It's two girls. Who initiates the sex? Oh, no, we wait for the guy to do it. That's going to say, oh, well, there's no guy ready. <laughs> so we'll just sit here and hold hands then on sofa. You know, it's like, how does this happen? So it's quite useful to learn these things. And um, therapy could be a place to do that. We can help people enhance their life skills, improve their work-life balance, because some gay people work a bit too hard and don't have enough balance. Um, trying to prove themselves, and they, we can help people recover from abuse, sexual abuse or neglect um, as children or as adults. And there's a higher proportion of uh, lesbians and gay men are sexually abused than in the heterosexual population. Um, and I think Finkelhall did, did, did this research, is that right? I'm not in gay, but my sexual abuse met experts are nodding at me. Um, one of the reasons is that I think les young lesbians get um, sexually abused, often by family members, and it's a kind of it's, it's a bit like a punishment abuse or punishment rapes. It's like brothers or relatives showing them what they're missing um, and thinking that what they need is a, is a good man and then they'll be on the straight narrow and they'll be fine. Um, gay men, young, young gay men get sexually abused because they feel alienated from their peers um, and quite lonely and isolated. So they, they're not hanging out with the guys playing football, they're cycling around the park or going for long walks in the woods. And, if a friendly male adult is going to be nice to them, then they might talk to him because this is someone who might be listening or understanding or friendly or supportive. And they don't feel like they get that at home and they can't talk about themselves. And so one thing leads to another and they, they're, a, they're being groomed for sexual abuse. So, I mean, that's a kind of rapid lesson into why I think that happens. Um, but if you are going to go to therapy, um, I think it's really wise to choose therapist uh, carefully. And so here are some uh, questions you could think about in interviewing a therapist. And um, I recommend people do this. I, I see a lot of people for initial consultations or assessments at Pink Therapy. Um, and then I try and find people if I don't feel I can write them, I recommend them some, some names. And I say go and interview them. Right? You're going to invest a lot of your time and your money and your energy in this. Don't just pick the first person. Find out a bit about them beforehand, because they might not tell you much later, depending on their model. So this would be my kind of short-hand way of you know, checking someone out, trusting your instincts. Can I see myself talking about my darkest thoughts and fantasies with this person? Maybe not on the first, second session or the first session, but you know, in a few sessions' time, can I imagine that that's going to happen? The theoretical model, I think, is not really very relevant. It might matter to those of you that are trained, but it doesn't really matter. In terms of outcome studies, it's, what, it's the relationship that counts. It's, it's how you feel. It's the client sitting there. It doesn't really matter what the therapist is doing with the, your story in their head or what they're saying. It's like how you feel with them. Ask them are they experienced at working with gender and sexual minorities. 
Um, I, I'm using the term gender and sexual minorities a lot more now. I'm not talking about LGBT because we ran out of letters when we got to IQQAA. So it's no longer lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, intersex, queer, questioning, and allies. It was too much of a mouthful. So I talk about, and it, was, it left out quite a lot. So I. I am um, talking about gender and sexual minorities. And gender and sexual minorities are, if we take the gender minorities, it's anyone on a gender spectrum. From a one end, people who are transsexual, living full time in their chosen gender, going through surgery and hormones and all of that, through to people who might be cross dressing or transvestite, people who are playing with gender, people who are gender queer, people who are refusing to play along with the gender binary, people who are intersex people who are drag queens and drag kings, I mean, anyone on the spectrum of gender. There's a lot of people. In London, you see a lot of it. You might not see much of it up here, but there's a lot of it. There's a lot of gender in London. Um, and then sexual minorities, so we've got lesbian, gay, bisexual. Um, but I would also say that people who are asexual are a sexual minority, and, and asexuality is emerging as a valid sexual orientation. So people who have no sexual response or feelings at all. People who are celibate. Um, I also see people who are in non-traditional relationships, so they're not monogamous, they might be polyamorous, and they might not feel comfortable going to relate. My, my indication is that if you feel comfortable going to relate, you go to relate. If you don't, come to see us. Um, people who are involved in BDSM and kink, either as a lifestyle or practices, um, they wouldn't fit in the LGBT. I might see heterosexuals who are interested or involved in media sanity. So that's quite a range of uh, sexual minorities. Um, I, think, I think, speaking to you as therapists, I think we have a moral and ethical obligation to ensure that we're fit to practice and that we can provide the highest standards of service to our gender and sexual minority clients. These are the kind of people that I, we are seeing, really. This is demanding work with a population with extraordinarily diverse needs and issues. Um, and I think we need specific training to learn about these diverse groups. And I feel that general counselling and therapy training courses are not preparing students for this work. And so I wonder, is it ethical to work with a group when you've not had any training to do so? What specific training have you had to work with gender and sexual minorities? What courses have you been on? What conferences have you attended? Do you subscribe to any journals, like the Journal of Gay and Lesbian Mental Health? Or what textbooks have you read? It's not enough to be liberally open-minded and to have a gay and lesbian, or lesbian friend. Um, um, or to feel that your shared sexual identity is sufficient training. Um, and if you feel that is qualification enough, I think it shows how little you really know about the field and how much more there is to learn. Um, we have a directory at, at, at Pink Therapy of therapists in private practice who want to list their practice with us. So people who are looking, clients who are looking for a non pathologizing therapist can log on to the website. It's called the Directory of Pink Therapists. Um, and I often hear, you know, get, get people filling in forms. It's soon going to be going where it, next month it's being launched where you can create your own profile online and maintain it. But at the moment they fill in the form and they send it into us and we type it up and put it on the website. And I look at these and, I, and we ask, what specific training have you had? What specific experience have you got? And largely there's none. And I think, well, should I just not put them in the directory? Um, but then I think, well, they might be good souls, and if we offer them a discount on going and getting some training, maybe they'll skill up. So I, for the last 10 years, we've had this directory, and I offer a discount on our training workshops to encourage people to come and get some training. Not many people take up the discount, which is interesting. I think they see us as a new market or a, a way of um, increasing their practice, which is just a place to advertise without really committing themselves to much CPD. Um, but working, uh, but there also may also be, um, 
quite a lot of gender and sexual minority therapists who are wanting to help their community. Um, I had one yesterday from somebody who said that he's four years ago he left his wife and he's now living in, in he's now an accredited counsellor and he's trained and he's really happy and he wants to help other men like him who have been on his journey. I'm thinking, well, so could he go in the direction? I'm thinking, well, I don't know how many ex-married men there are going to be who are going to see your entry and want to come and talk to you about it. You know, there might be all sorts of people who want to come and see you. That sense of identification might actually be dangerous rather than helpful, because you might over-identify. Um, but there are quite a lot of gender and sexual minority therapists who feel like they want to help their community, but they've not undertaken any training or engaged in depth on themselves in personal therapy. With someone who's skilled and knowledgeable in gender and sexual minority issues. Because I think, you know, therapy isn't actually a requirement for a lot of courses, but you're not expected to go and work on yourself. You might do a bit of PD groups, and that seems enough by some courses. Um, well, if you're a lesbian or gay man, are you really going to talk about yourself in a PD group with a lot of heterosexuals? I don't think so. Um, and if you're going to therapy as a lesbian or a gay man with a heterosexual therapist, are you really feeling free to talk about yourself in depth with them, or are you censoring stuff? Do you talk about the kind of sex you're into, your sexual fantasies and feelings, the relationship difficulties with this heterosexual therapist, or do you kind of edit it out and talk about your career instead, or something useful? I, um, I think there's a lot of self-censoring goes on, and I think if you're, you know, we, we run a one-year training in gender and sexual minorities, um, and it's often made a requirement for people coming on there. If they haven't had good quality therapy yet, because of where they are and the opportunities, um, we might make that a requirement for them during the course. Um, and then how knowledgeable is your supervisor, your clinical supervisor, where you're taking your cases to the talk? What specific training has your supervisor had in working with gender and sexual minorities? What do they know? Ask them. Because if you, you know, everything otherwise is going through a heteronormative lens or heteronormative ears and doesn't really make sense to them in the way that it might make sense to someone who's experienced. Now, I might be preaching to the perverted. So if you are experienced and you've committed yourself to a minimum of 30 hours of specific training, or then you could apply for our accreditation. Um, because we've got our own accreditation scheme. Uh, so we're running a range of different workshops. I thought these were coming up, I've been talking. Um, so we run a three weekend course called The Essentials. That's what we think is the very most basic, the three weekends. Um, we also run a weekend on introducing psychosexual therapy with gender and sexual minorities. We've got the one year certificate, which is accredited now by Middlesex University. Um, and we've got extensive day workshops. And in the next year, we've got a weekend on two, work, two workshops over a weekend on working with transgender people. We have a workshop on understanding kink and BDSM. We have a, week, a workshop on relationship therapy with, with um, LGBTs. One on spirituality. Another on God conflict and religious conflict. One on working with the erotic in therapy. All really important issues. So I'm going to draw it to a close. If you want, here's the email address for you to get the presentation. But I'm also open to, I'm really interested to hear what have been your own experiences of trying to seek therapy, and was your therapist attuned and informed and understanding or not? Because that's really useful to kind of get, for us to become aware of of what the quality is like. I mean, maybe up here is fantastic. Um, and if you're in training, what does your training cover in terms of gender and sexual minority therapy? How much will you talk on your course? So, over to you.